The state prison system is, after all, run by Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. But it turns out only about half the inmates are actually participating in rehabilitation and other programs. That's according to a report released by CDCR. Vincent Gerald Garcia of Salinas and Jorge Jasso of Soledad are the last two dependents, defendants rather, of a case involving the stabbing and beating of other gang members within the jail. There were three cases of these attacks in the main yard, with Garcia approving them and Jasso participating. The pair face a maximum of life in prison in their sentencing hearings. So, so you obviously found yourself in a situation that led to you being in bad standings at some point. What happened if you're willing to speak on it and do you feel like you were given your due process or do you feel like you were just disregarded and tossed to the side? Honestly, they gave me a, they actually gave me an opportunity to plead my case. It's just, I had to report to the back, but there was a lot of things taking place on the yard at the time where I felt like I couldn't go on the next thing smoking to go report to Mondo and Court for Shoot. All the charges that I got charged with that I did a video about, in all honesty, they were true. I was, I got a lot of people in Arizona validated. That was a big issue. That's because my celly was like, hey, um, you know, be the bad guy for once, bro. Just, we're not in the, we're not in California jurisdiction. That means we could do things a little bit different here. So I was allowing things like that to happen. I, I was kind of overlooking homeboys. I, we had so much drugs, but it was so much harder to sell because we were segregated at the time. I knew homies were in the cell playing with their nose and playing Xbox and PlayStation, being up one night. I didn't care as long as they weren't fighting each other. A lot of money that was uh, being accumulated out of state. You got to remember, I had federal carnales from the feds talking about reports to them that I had California saying, hey, bro, you're not under federal jurisdiction. You're still California inmate. So what did I do? I didn't report to neither. I just put all the money on Auto Edmano's books, kept a lot of it for myself, shot what I needed to shoot to the C payroll. And I got in trouble for that. They said $1,400 was missing that needed to be reported. Then I let a lot of homeboys get gang-related tattoos. Normally, the household policy is, is you can get your town. That's it. But I was letting homies be a little bit more prideful, like represent where you're from, represent the bottom that you sacrificed for. A lot of homies are doing life for, you know, East Side San Hall, your, you know, Antioch. So I was like, go ahead, man, get your hood tatted on you. Just don't make it crazy. Then I started seeing homeboys getting Farmetto Birds and XIVs and X4s, and I was like, bro, I got enough big problems as it is. I'm not worried about no tattoo. Little, little did I know the whole time that they were, we were being monitored and it got a lot of people validation points for that. But overall, I take pride in my mistakes. I, I, I had to pay for them. I could have pleaded my case a little bit differently, but well, if you guys watch my video on Ready Get Media, why? Because the, the Southerners did book four homies and left them and sent them airlifted to the hospital. So I'd rather have been on the line in battle, ready for battle, than to say, you know what, let me uh, go beat up somebody real quick. I gotta go report to Corbin and show, I'll be back. And then the war kicks off, that's abandonment. That's desertion. That's a violation of the bond. And I'm like, look, I'll smash the dude regardless. I said, you want me to stab him? And I'm like, no, 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 just, just put hands on him. And, and this is how we're gonna do it, right? Because you're the closest cell to him. Your cell is gonna run point. When we go out for chow in the morning, kind of link up with him and walk together with him and and try to set it up. We're gonna try to move you guys up in a line so that when we walk back from chow, you know, hurry up with him. Tell him you're gonna go smoke a cigarette because he was asking for tobacco. Tell him you got some tobacco, you're gonna go roll a cigarette with him. And kind of rush up to the fourth tier as soon as you can, go straight back to his cell because the gunner, the gunners are more likely to be in the front where people are coming up the stairs and going onto the tiers and that's where the congestion is. And, and so that's where they're really watching and keeping an eye. They're not necessarily watching the back bar until about the time that the seal is ready to go back there and lock the bar. So I'm like, okay, cool. And, uh, and so I said, just go, just go put them on them, right? And so it, we, everything went as planned, right? Go to job, kicking it, talking to the dude, come back up. I'm like, hey, when we get back, let's hurry up and go. And, um, and I'll shoot you some cigarettes at your cell. 
you know, before they come and lock us down. Okay. And a dude is unsuspecting as, as can be, right? So we go walking over there towards his cell. And sure enough, there's no gun or no nothing. And so he gets to be in front of his cell and I start getting off on him, right? Boom, boom, boom. And I'm not saying anything to him. I want to try to be quiet because I don't want to draw attention to, to what's going on. And, and I'm just kind of determined. So I'm letting him have it. And he falls up against this little wall and the wall has, it's, it's like the Corcoran shoe doors for those that have been there uh, or the base shoe doors, very similar to. So it has these little holes, it's thick, but it has these holes everywhere. And so I do realize one time I miss him, right? Cause I'm on him and he's scratched it up and he's, he's not swinging back. He never swings on me. He's just trying to buckle. And I'm trying to get him like face shots or good shots, not just hit him in the back of the head. Cause that hurts when you keep hitting somebody back of the head, right? And I remember I'm trying to prove a point and I wind up hitting that grill. Boom, and I scratch up my knuckles and that shit hurt. So I hear my cellie, he's standing in front of our cell. He's down a little bit. He's like, Rascal, that's good, that's good, Rascal. Kukui, kukui, that's good. And I was like, all right. So I come back in the cell and he goes and walks over there, right? To where I just came from. He goes and walks over there. I don't hear it, but apparently he tells the dude, hey, when the seal comes to lock the bar right now, uh, you need to tell him that you can't be here and you better not fucking tell him why. And so then he comes back to the cell. Well, my hand is red and it's already starting to get a little bit, not swollen big, but you know, it's marked up. And he's like, hey, you gotta be careful because you know, this dude's gone, bro. They're likely to come by the cells and check hands. And they check hands, you're going to the hole. I said, Phil, what do I do? He says, sit on the toilet and soak your hand in the toilet. And I know that sounds disgusting to people that haven't been in prison, but for one, the inside of our toilet was amazingly clean, just like everything else in the cell. Uh, we wash clothes in there, we did all kinds of stuff. But also that toilet bowl water is cold. It's the coldest water that you can get, basically. And I think that's true for about any prison, uh, but certainly the ones I've been to. And so I set up the little half sheet to make it look like I'm using the bathroom, right? And I sit down and, and I just got my hand in the toilet water and the seal walks by, right? The seal goes and you can hear him at the cell. He goes, oh, what happened to you? <sighs> All right, you guys, th okay. And so grabs him and the dude goes walking down tier. Seal locks the bar. And the dude goes walking down tier and he's got a sheet with his stuff in it. And he's walking, he doesn't even look towards our cell. The CO does, and he's like, and keeps going. So I'm trying to soak my hand. I'm, I'm trying to make sure that it doesn't get me caught up. They never came and checked hands. happened was is that one of the OG Filipino homies he wasn't really much of a gangster or nothing he was on the other yard and he was celled up with one of my Usos over there and the Filipino homie he was in the cell with him and you know he had saw that the homie had some knives in the cell dude didn't you know dude wasn't no gangster like I said so he got scared and he went to the police and he told on that Uso and said that he had knives in the cell so that Oos ends up going to the back and he's facing charges. He's back there in the hole now and it's all bad. So, you know, when shit like that happens, it hurts us because, you know, we're a small group and he's one of the soldiers that, you know, we want to keep on the yard. A lot of the homies was pissed and they wanted, you know, they wanted to make sure that justice was served to this dude. And so we're all standing around, we're talking about it and there was a little Filipino cat that was there in this meeting and he was a good homie of mine. And he was a youngster. He had made his way up to a level four from a level one. This dude has been riding his whole fucking time. So he's standing there, he's listening to what's going on. He gets to see the paperwork, you know, he knows what's happening and he, he speaks up and he says, hey, I don't want nobody else touching my people let me do it, you know, that's my people's. I want to handle this. I don't want nobody else doing it. So, you know, we all decided that out of respect, we won't allow him to do it, even though the homies on the other yard 
they really wanted it to be a host to handle it because they wanted it done a certain way. You know, I mean, they wanted this dude to be an example. So the little body, the little body homie, the little body homie, he was just like, nah, man, I'm gonna take care of it. You know what I'm saying? So just set it up. So it went down, walking to chow. It was like breakfast time. The little homie makes his move, you know, right there on the way to the chow hall. And uh, he gets the OG pretty good. And, and you know, he keeps giving him the business even though the yard goes down. So the gunner has to, you know, shoot off the block gun to stop it. You know, the gunner had to shoot off the block gun to stop the whole thing. And um, as we're laying there and we're all proned out, uh, the OG Filipino homie, you know, he's leaking all over and he's like, you know, hey, buddy, who who did this to me? What happened, you know? And uh, and the little Filipino homie was like, I did, you know, because you told. And uh, so, you know, that's how that shit goes. So basically, he convinced me to say, you know what, we need to relinquish everything in our in our in our in our in our property. That way, if they come, they put us on potty watch for three days and send us to the hole. We have everything memorized. We can just jot down reports, you know, off our head. I said, all right. So I go use the bathroom, take everything out, and I put it in a uh, in a brown paper bag, and I tie it, and I tell the homie, "You gonna go next?" He's like, "I already have everything out," and which he did. He had his bundle right there on the side, and he had a. Uh, he had his banger, and I was like, okay. He's like, go ahead, fool, we'll fish it down to the homie kid from Visalia. And I was like, all right. So I called a homie kid on the tier, he says, what's up? I was like, hey, fool, we'll shoot your line. I grabbed his line, and I write a little note, like, hey, bro, I'm gonna leave this with you, get it to Puppet, get it to, to the homie as fast as you can. So I'm shooting everything down the tier, and I'm at the bottom of the door. And I'm kneeling down, I'm looking through the crack of the door, I'm looking at the bottom of the floor to make sure everything got there, nothing fell on the tier. And, you know, and then I, I reached back finally and I was like, hey, shoot your stuff. But I wasn't looking at my celly. And my celly goes, hey bro, you fucked up. And I was like, what? He goes, yeah, bro, you gotta go. So I grabbed the, I grabbed the string off the tier and I tied it around the edge of the door and I'm still down, I'm like, I'm kneeling down. I'm like, what do you mean I gotta go? What the hell are you talking about, bro? Are you tripping? Cause I knew he was high. He was like, look, bro, I just got this letter from the homie that you gotta go. So now my heart starts racing and my face, I could feel my face turn hot and red and I'm like, oh shit. So I stand up. Mind you, I just relinquished everything that I had, my weapon, and I see him with his weapon in his hand. I'm like, bro, what the fuck are you talking about? And that's the only thing I could ask because I'm still dumbfounded about what took place and, and what's going on. He didn't even let me read the letter and he was like, pretty much, bro, you know, everything that they concluded about your investigation, bro, is, you know, you messed up. You fucked up a lot. And with this, I go, what do you mean with this? I mean, this had nothing to do with me or you. That homie got off that bus and made a bad decision because he was uneducated. He didn't know no better. I go, and you're telling me that I messed up? How is it that I messed up? You're the one that's authority in charge. This is your job. This is your jurisdiction. This is your responsibility. And he was like, hey, bro. The homie said, you got to go, bro. You got to go. I go, we're supposed to be brothers, but we're part of a brotherhood. I'm your brother. They're not your brothers. And all he said was, hey, bro, it's better than you than me. And when he did that, I seen him run towards me. And he had that metal flat, and he swung it at me. First thing I could do was go like that. I just I didn't want to hit my face, so I just put my head down and he split my head right here. I got about 13 stitches. And when he split it, boom, I hit my back, hit the, the door. He grabbed me by the throat to push me against the door and he swung it again. And when he swung it, his arm was right here, my hand went over here and I tried to catch his hand. But when I, I couldn't catch it just enough, I grabbed it like right here and the piece hit me right here and it split my lips right here. You'll see, if you look closely at me and you can see like the little scars, it's split, like the, the piece hit me and I just felt my both sides just rip open. So finally, he's a big boy, so I finally just dug down and I pushed him back as far as I could by his waist and I threw him. 
you st- that's when we square off and I start punching him. You know, he was a little chunky guy, so he had little short arms. So I'm punching him to keep him away from me. I'm kicking his knee, trying to get him to fall. And and when he swung it again, I moved. And he went past me and I, I put my arm around his uh, his arm and I grabbed the piece. But when I grabbed the piece, I grabbed this hand, grabbed this hand, and this hand grabbed the piece and he pulled back. And when he pulled back, you I have scars that go right here across my fingers. Where he sliced where it sli- the blade sliced my finger. Cause it was a flat and he sharpened both sides to a tip. So it was like a double edged sword. So he sliced my fingers and I, I backed up again. I'm like, damn. And I'm panicking, not knowing what to do. I'm just trying to self defend myself and not really engage upon this individual. And he swings it again, but he misses. And when he misses, I hit him, we start punching. I finally get him to drop the piece after a while. Cause he was running out of breath. So after, now he was just pushing me off him. Now I have the upper hand. Where I messed up as he ducked and I hit the bunk. And when I hit the bunk, I broke my knuckle. I pushed my knuckle all the way back and it was just sticking out right here. And I was like, shit. I, we wind up stop fighting, but I'm bleeding everywhere. Bad timing. Because they were they, they finally instituted, because for a while, when you're going locked down the first couple of weeks, they don't give you showers every three days. They're just waiting to see what the program is. You have to get the, I can't remember what it's called. Like it's R something, it's like uh, what the program's gonna start looking like for the next couple of months. Well, they incorporated it, but they didn't give us the list, the paperwork to say that this is what your guys' program gonna consist of. They started running program showers. And everybody, the, we're like the fourth, we're like the fourth cell down from the end of the tier. The dude's got, the cop has to go check the count, ask who wants showers. And I can hear him saying, you guys gonna shower? You guys are gonna shower? I have blood all over the concrete on the floor. So I grabbed the floor towel and I started wiping it and my cell is like on a bunk, just heaving, you know, trying to catch his breath. And he's like, what are you doing? I was like, bro, I'm trying to clean this shit up, bro. Just, just don't, just don't, just act normal. Totally forgot that my face was leaking. So I'm all dumping the, to- the, the, the floor towel in the toilet water to clean the blood so it's not noticeable. I'm flushing it. And the cop goes, you guys want a shower? And he's seen it. He's seen me cleaning the blood. He's seen me leaking and he presses the button. He's asking me a question. I was like, nah, bro, me and my cell were working out before uh, showers. We were doing burpees and I, my hand slipped on the puddle of slip of sweat and my head hit the face. My head hit the, the the concrete, should I say. And they all just started laughing. I mean, it was the best lie I can come up with in in this moment, bro, because I, I haven't had a chance to think for myself. I'm still processing what's going, what the just hell just happened. And he goes, man, the sergeant goes, man, I've been a sergeant for 25 years in the correctional facilities and I have never seen somebody get their face and their head split from a burpee. But I already lied, bro, so I can't change my story now. So I'm like, hey, man, that's what happened, man. So they escort me to the program office, take me to medical. They stitch me up. These didn't need stitches. It just opened up my skin a little bit, but it, it, it would bleed. Right here, my teeth got punched through my lip, but the teeth came back out when we were boxing. So I was bleeding right here, but, you know, I didn't have to pull my teeth out during that time. It was just split. I only had like three stitches right here. Yeah, yeah. It's for my progressive thinkers. Well, one day I was really wanting a hooter and I hit the yard. I knew there was some weed out there. So I was asking a couple of different woods. This one wood. He's like, no, no, I got none, but I mean, I got some action, whatever. He saw me had some. I was like, oh, whatever, dude, I ain't tripping. I ended up getting no weed. A week later, maybe less, that fool who said, said he had a little bit of action came up to me and gave me a big old knot of weed. Like a $50 plug, like, bam, big old sack of weed.
And and they knew I had the weed. Fucking my homeboy, they're being dirty anyway. Just us being from Bakersfield, the same car that should just gave me that bag of weed. As big as they were doing it. So let me talk about this removal, one of the craziest removals I've ever seen. It wasn't the woods, it was another car, and I don't want to tell you who it was. I'm at Wasco reception. This this car, they're all having a spread. Everyone threw in their lunch meat, everyone threw in their bread, everyone threw in some chips, a bunch of people threw in soup, some people threw in a breakfast tray, there's some porters, some eggs, some potatoes. They had a big bag, garbage bag. Sometimes the cops poke holes in them. So real tedious that sit there for a couple hours tying those little holes up. But knots in them, a big old spread. When it's ready, they do a head count. Okay, there's 40 fools here, they got 40 bowls. They do it evenly, everybody gets a bowl. So, hey, ready, everyone come eat. Everyone grabs a bowl. This one fool though, he grabs a bowl, and he grabs another one and dumps it in there and puts like that. Doubled up, excuse me. And have no idea why I gave the thumbs up for that. Excuse me. But doubled up. Which means someone got to the end, like, whoa, no bowl for me. And they looked around, homeboys in the corner, just like they're like looking around for a bowl and it's like, come on, don't take long to be like, dude, you have two bowls. I'm nosy. When something's going on with pain, I'm the type of dude like, dude, what's going on, dog? What happened, dog? So I was working out right by the table while they're eating. I saw the commotion. I was kind of ear hustling a little bit. And I was working out like, what the fuck? I heard them confronting about the bowl. And their head honcho was literally like in the bed area right next to me where I was working out. They called him over there. They're like, what, what's up, dude? You got like two bowls? And he explained so like, no, no, no. It was, it was already like that when I grabbed it. And they picked it up and looked the one underneath it. Had a residue, had a noodle or whatever. And they're like, no, nah, dude, you, you doubled up. Plus you tell there's more food in that bowl. It just caught red handed, bro. The head honcho told me, you know what, man, just get the fuck away from me. So he walked out of the bed area and they called him, he started to go back there and now he's out of my peripheral vision. And now I don't know what's going on. I'm just working out. But I hear him get hit. And I can tell what he got hit with was, is with a cup. He got hit with one of the cups. State issue cup. Really what it is, it's a hollowed out rock with a handle on it. Those things are so thick, I could probably just start destroying my TV to smash this freaking desk with one of those cups. Boom, Molly walked him, I heard him at the floor. Bam! I still work up. I hear him get up. I hear some people saying, hey, fuck, I gotta talk shit to him. And now he goes walking by. He's gonna go over to the cops. But when he walks past me, he still had that bowl in his hand. I couldn't believe it. I lost my shit. I start laughing so loud. I had to play it off like I was laughing at my workout partner. I couldn't let anyone think I was laughing at him. I was like, oh, dude, check you out, dude. Damn, you're sweating so much, bro. It looks like you beat your pants, dog shit. Bathroom's over here, bro. Ha ha, laughing. But no, it was so funny. They have him have that bowl. No, no, no. It was like an extra bowl. It goes over there. Wham! Gets hit and comes walking by the bowl. Like, dude, how do you not drop that bowl? But asking around, hearing about it later, what happened was when he fell down, someone will grab the bowl, put the food in it, the fell and the spoon. When he got up, they go, here, here's your bowl. And he was too much in a daze. He go, all right, grabbed it and just walked off. Damn, got that ass. What was the craziest shit you saw in Florence? Mm. Those off the wall shit you saw? Carnitas got killed. That was fucked up. Who? Carnitas. Paisa? I uh, use the South Side Serenio from Quattro Flats. I know what Quattro Flats is. Yeah, he was fucking in my unit, dude. He was cool. I mean, like, two weeks before he got killed was maybe a couple weeks before was his birthday, and he came to me because I used to cook up this mean ass fucking pasta dish, dude. And, um, He's like, Chilla, you cook that pasta for me and my homies on my birthday. And I was like, and he's like, I'll give you and your celly a free bowl and I'll pay you 10 bucks. I'm like, hell yeah, I'll do that for you, dog. And so I made it up and fucking we, we ate. And it was crazy because the dudes that killed him were the same ones that were eating with him on, that, on his birthday, dog. No it was shit. a trip, yeah, but it was the Some ugliest. of his homies? Yeah, yeah. They had some type of internal beef going on i can't speak on it because yeah it was a i seen a mutilation that day bro i fool got mutilated dog they did it bad mm -hmm. dude for like 30 about 30 oh, minutes man. dog and it was ugly blocks knives but dude was a soldier he told him uh they kept saying check in on me check in and he said fuck you kill me oh they were trying to remove it mm -hmm. Yeah, it was ugly. And, and he then, wouldn't go. Uh -uh, he wouldn't go. Don't get that on your shirt. I guess. Shit. And it was a bad call, too. Thank you. Oh, man. So, um, just, yeah, like yeah. I said, 
That sucks even worse. A whole lot of shit stemmed from that. But it was so ugly. And, uh, like, I've never been the same ever since then. I'll bad. tell you that much. Because the next morning I woke up. I thought I was cool, but, but I must have been in shock. But I woke up the next morning and my jaw was clenched shut, dude. My celly had me, helped me unlock my jaw, dude. My shit was like... So I must have been gritting my teeth all night and shit. But it was fucked up, dude. It was really fucked up. I've never seen them like it. And then there's still sounds from that morning that are uh, like those, you know, the plastic chairs. You hear them when they pull them across. Well, the, they scoot across the ground. Yeah, and you yeah. you hear people banging yeah, and they yeah. scoot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then and it, it's kind of quiet. And then you hear that. Just, just like remembrances. Like, I guess it would be like nostalgic type shit is how you... I would explain. I don't know. Is it's probably one? a form of PTSD, mm. realistically. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's probably a form yeah, of that. Yeah. It was. It definitely did. It. And, you know, like, ever since then, I've kind of just been like, if anything trauma pops off around me or something, like, I'll fucking freak the fuck out, dog. Like, sometimes I'll really freak out. And, like, if I have little issues with people out here, I'll fucking... Sometimes I'll take it to the extreme, like, as far as my defense, you know, like, I'll fucking, it might just be a couple words, dude, but I'm gonna fucking strap up and ready to fucking die and ready to kill him because I see how fragile life can can be and how quick it can be taken from you. And it's a lot different when you're sober in there, in that environment, and not, you know, I've seen a lot of shit at the bars, all drunk and shit like that, but... Man, when you see that shit in real life, dog, fuck, that shit's fucking vicious, man. Hmm. It's vicious, man. Forever that day will change me. But, it is what it is. A lot of times I ask me and my cell, you ask each other, we should, or tell each other, we should have jumped in. We should have jumped in. What is this man thing to do? Oh, shit. Yeah. Um, we should have jumped in and we should have stopped it but in that environment you know what I'm saying we can't do that yeah you can't do that we'd have done that we would have been the next ones on the chopping block you know what I mean that's always the scariest thing when your old homies coming for you yeah it don't matter when anybody else comes for you don't <laughs> who cares you know what I mean yeah yeah that's what's really fucked me up is when I when I noticed that I thought you know, your car was going to ride with you, but it did. That's who comes to get you, bro. Your own people. This individual be yelling off his gate, you know, just doing a bunch of dumb shit. So, you know, in retrospect, when I think back on it, I don't know why the woods didn't deal with it because really that was their problem, their responsibility. It was on them to remove that dude. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was, they didn't really have anybody that was really functioning on that level over there. Cause a lot of times you'll get a lot of white guys that just come through West Block that are just regular individuals. They're not into politics. They don't have a leader. Only, you know, certain ones are on that level. Nazi lowriders, ABs, obviously, other dudes that have been gamed up, but if they're not there, they're not there. So I don't know why I didn't ask questions, but when I think back on it, it's like, you know, it's crazy because something like that, you know, could, could really have kicked off a war. If we're removing somebody that's not a northerner and is outside our, our ethnicity, that can be an issue. But for whatever reason, they put a green light on that on that individual. So I was told by Puppet, Puerto Rican Puppet, that I would be participating in a removal. Basically what they were saying is that they just wanted this dude out of there. They just basically wanted him socked up and got up out of there, how, however it was done. And they wanted, you know, preferably they wanted it, they wanted us to get away with it. They didn't want us to stay on them. They just wanted us to just smash this dude's head in and leave him smashed up on the tier so that they get him up out of there. Anyways, there was three of us and we didn't talk about how it was gonna, you know, how it was gonna happen other than we were gonna approach him on the tier and we were gonna get him on the tier. 
we should always use a weapon. If we're gonna go in on somebody, we're gonna spill their blood. It makes no sense socking them up so that they could look in the mirror and they could heal up three days later and laugh about it. You know, we wanted to give them something to remember us by, you know, give them a Kool-Aid smile, uh, a necktie or plug them with something. So I always believed in using a weapon and I always wanted to use a weapon because at that time, you know, I was still trying to earn my bones. I still had that mindset or that mentality of, you know, if if I get an op if I get an opportunity to stab somebody, I want to make it as good of a stabbing as I can, as messy and as bloody as I can, so that the homies would be like, "That's a sick ass fool right there." That's that's the mentality, straight up. You know, you don't want to just go up to somebody, poke them a couple times, and you know, homies are gonna look at you and be like, "Man, that was weak, bro. He barely plugged that fool." I could see him when we got like halfway down the tier. He was like closer towards the end. But I remember seeing him leaning through the bars, like looking down towards the bottom tiers, like towards the the first tier. So I was the last of us three. The other two homies were in front of me. So when we got up to him, the other two homies kept kept walking past him and got on the other side of him. And I slid up right next to him. And literally, as soon as we got there, you know. This dude didn't, ex he didn't see nothing. He didn't suspect nothing, but we didn't waste no time. As soon as we were on both sides of him, we just went in on him and it was, here you go. So anyways, <laughs> so anyways, we're going in on this dude. We're beating the shit out of him. We got him up on the gate and you know, this dude's not trying to fight back. You know, his lunch goes flying. Somebody picked up his lunch and we're just, we're fucking this dude up, you know what I mean? He's got some baggy ass, I remember he had some baggy ass um, oranges on and you know, his top shirt got ripped off. Like we were, we were trying to tear this fool apart, man. But at one point I remember we had him up on the gates and then we had him up on the bars. And one of the other homies from, from Hayward, <laughs> this fool, when he, when he, when we had him on the bars, we we're pounding this fool. Beep, bop, beep, bop, blah, blah, beep, bop. This fool was just trying to cover up, but he started to try to push this dude through the bars. And when I seen what he was doing, he was trying to throw him off the tier, basically. When I seen what he was doing, I started to push him. So now all three of us are, are trying to push this dude through the bars <laughs> so that he'll take a, a little swan dive to the first tier. Well, he's holding on for dear life, man. Believe me, I'm taking shots to his face and I'm hitting him, I'm hitting him wherever I can hit him because he's stuck completely through the bars now, but he's got his legs wrapped around like a koala bear and he's got his arms wrapped around the bars. He's bear hugging him. This dude will not let the bars go. And I mean, I'm trying to pull his arms. The other homie was trying to pull his legs apart, but he kept on wrapping his legs and his arms around until finally, this dude is either half monkey or he's just the luckiest JK in San, in San Quentin at that time because what ended up happening is eventually I thought we were going to push him off because he came loose but he swung down and somehow caught on to the to the bars on the second tier and and crawled down where we couldn't get to him he basically he crawled down to the second tier and when we looked through when I looked through he he, he was just climbing through the bars on the second tier but I mean, we did our we did our part. Homeboy said, you know, the, the, the main thing was to get away, and that's what we did. Now